The 2023 Paris Air Show was truly remarkable. There were orders aplenty and planes galore. But what interests me most about events like this is the people. After all, the industry's biggest players all gather in one spot to exchange ideas. I had the pleasure of chatting with dozens of experts at this year's show, and what you're about to watch was one of the more fascinating conversations I had. I sat down with Darren Hulst, who heads up commercial marketing at Boeing, and we discussed everything from the 787 Freighter to the 777-10. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy this fascinating look into the future of Boeing. Thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself and telling sure. the folks at home what it is you do? Sure. I'm uh, Darren Hulst. I'm the Vice President of Commercial Marketing uh, for Boeing. And I've been in the role since just when the pandemic started. Okay. And I've been with Boeing uh, for 18 years. Wow. Long time. Yeah. <laughs> so you're the guy to go to for sales, marketing, and, and everything in between. I would say our, our team handles everything from supporting sales from a technical standpoint all the way to where is the industry headed in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I want to cover today. Last week, you guys released your market outlook yep. for the next 20 years. Yep. Can you kind of give me broad strokes what it is that current market outlook told us and anything that stood out to you in particular? Um, honestly, it is boring. And what I mean by that is it reinforced the views that we had on the industry last year and the year before that. We're, we're no longer thinking about recovery. We're back to the fundamentals that drive air travel. I think it also reinforces the, the need to have a versatile fleet of aircraft. Airlines don't want to take the risk on an airplane that's too big or too small when they can have a fleet of aircraft that can fly all of their network with um, incredible commonality. Sure. And I think, you know, you, you want to be able to have the most capability at the lowest risk. And airlines clearly see that opportunity um, with the demand in the market, but also with the right size planes. Yeah. I think that simplification is really interesting. Mm. You know, in the current market outlook, it said that some large percentage of airlines were eliminating at least one aircraft family yeah. from their fleet. Yeah. And you kind of look at Boeing's current lineup and the same thing almost resonates mm -hmm. with what you got. You only have the 737, 787. Right and the triple seven. So kind of starting on the bottom end of that lineup, the CMO dictated that single aisle aircraft are gonna dominate the order books yep. for the next 20 years. Sure. Right now, of course, the max is your offering in that segment, yep. and only half the, the fleet is out. Tell me a little bit about the max seven, and the max 10, how that certification process is coming along and when we might be able to see those aircraft sure. in service. Well, the, the 7377 is the closest to certification. It's the first in line. And uh, that should happen uh, sometime uh, the middle, middle to the late third quarter this year. Mm -hmm. And then as we look at the 737-10, that should follow as we look into middle of 2024. Sure. Um, and so obviously that's dependent on, on, on the regulator more than anything else. Yeah. But um, we're working obviously very closely to achieve those targets because we think it's an important addition to our family. It really completes the 737 MAX family, both mm -hmm. from an entry level standpoint with the 7, all the way to a growth uh, with, the, with the Dash 10 that just makes the airplane and the whole family even more valuable. I want to talk about that completion part yep. because once the Max 7 and the Max 10 enter service, of course it's going to round out the Max family, but I think some might still argue that the family to some degree is incomplete, mm. right? When you look at the competition, the A321LR, XLR, those aircraft have uh, up to 1,500 nautical miles of additional range mm. over something like the MAX 10. And it's allowed Airbus to take a big chunk of this emerging mid-market segment. How does Boeing address that kind of market gap that exists? You know, I think it's almost a little bit of a of, of phantom gap that exists in hmm. my mind. The 737 MAX family has more range than any NEO family member without AUX tanks, hmm. right? Um, the, the XLR, when it enters service, clearly does have range capability that's more than, than any 737 MAX type. But let's remember that only about one-third of 1% 1 of all single aisle missions are flown in that long range space. Sure. And I think that, that sort of bounds the size of the market. I don't view it as much of a gap as, as it is a compromise because range, it doesn't fly true long range capability. Size, 
you're only going to have 150, 160 seats on that aircraft, and then you limit the cargo capability and, and certainly even passenger baggage uh, capacity. Sure. And so, in my mind, it's a compromise in a space of the market that can also be served by a wide body. It mm -hmm. can also be served uh, with a 737 MAX on the shorter end of the, of the transatlantic type segment. And so, I think airlines value that more than they value just a very small niche uh, sure. of the global space. Yeah, everything's a game of trade-offs, yes, yes. right? Moving up market a little yep. bit, um, I wanna talk about the 767 Freighter, sure. which is a plane that doesn't get a lot of shine these right. days, um, but it is the backbone and the core of many freighter fleets. Yep. And in the market outlook, it was just over 1,200 planes of that size are gonna be needed in the freighter market moving forward. Yep. That being said, by 2027, new emissions and noise regulations mm -hmm. are going to essentially prohibit the 767 sure. from continuing production. So how do you think of the future of that segment? Is there a 767 MAX or a 787 mm. Freighter? Like, how do you plan for something like that? Well, I think you have to think about what capability our customers need. You know, is it the same as a 767 or is it the market today that wants to grow or wants to change in terms of size over time? And from my perspective, you know, you look at the 787 and, and what its size characteristics are and what it can provide for the market. And we have to look at how that could be a potential freighter solution and what type of capability that adds or, or provides to operators that are big with the 767 today, like FedEx, like UPS, DHL, and others. And so sure. we're making sure with our research, with our analysis, that we have a, a viable uh, mid-market freighter, um, you know, even beyond 2027. Sure. You know, I think of the 767 and you think of the tanker program, right? Sure. You folks have done a lot of modernization mm. with the cockpit, with the systems. Sure. It almost seems to me like there's this balance between ease of development, mm. where you've already kind of invested in the 767. Sure. You have this proven yeah. platform and assembly line, yeah. importantly, and then the 787, which maybe is a better longer term solution, but potentially would be harder to develop. Can you tell me how difficult do you think that would be to, to bring about a composite freighter? You know, um, I don't think the difficulties are as big as people think. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you, you're obviously dealing with a different material, but you still have titanium floor beams. You still have a structure and volume and all the other aspects that you have in a normal, you know, aluminum aircraft. And so I don't think the technical hurdles are as big as, as some people might think. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is more about the timing, about about uh, which size, about the development time frame and the certification ultimately that, that you need. But you have those same challenges if you look at the 767 and we continue to look at what that aircraft could look like you know, sure. in a different world. And the, the first and foremost on that would be certification. Yeah. You know, when you make a change to an airplane, whether it's the power plant, whether it's the wing, anything. You know, you're obviously looking at um, different certification and challenges that exist there as well. Stick into the 787. Yep. But moving over to the passenger variants, yeah. the thing is selling like hotcakes, yep. right? Airlines love it. Passengers love it. It is, it is. the undisputed market leader in its segment. Um, but when you look at the different 787 variants, you have this uneven distribution okay. of orders, right? Like at the very top end, the Dash 10 isn't selling as well as the mm. Dash 8 and the Dash 9. And I think to some degree, that's because it lacks the range of the 777-200ER it's replacing and the A350-900 it's competing against. Now, I know that Boeing has committed to mm. increasing the range yep. with a high gross weight version. So two-parter question here. Yep. One, what is the progress on that? And two, what actually needs to change on the airframe to enable that? Yeah, okay, so we're really close in, in, in entering the service of the first type that has the increased max takeoff weight capability will be sometime late next year. Okay. So we're you know, just over a year away from that. And what that does is gives the 787-10 about 500 nautical miles more range. Mm -hmm. The reason why that's significant is it puts it right on top of the capability of the 200ER. Yeah. It gives you 20 more seats, 15% more cargo capability, the same range at 30 to 35% lower cost per seat. So sure. it is a, just a game changer in terms of its capability, but also it completes sort of what the 787-10 can do. 
Sure. Um, it's not just a transatlantic airplane, it's a trans-Pacific airplane. And so it becomes extremely versatile in the networks that our airline customers need. From a structural standpoint, very little structural changes to the aircraft, a little strengthening to the gear, a little strengthening locally. Um, and really, it's just we have proven through the airplanes in, in service that there's more fuel capability in the aircraft and, and also uh, more ability to handle uh, slightly higher payloads. And sure. so those two things are really what drive the value, but there's very little actual changes to the aircraft to the point where it, it's, it's an inconsequential change to the weight of the aircraft, mm -hmm. which means the same economics are just giving you even more um, uh, capability. Yeah, no auxiliary yeah. fuel tank no. being added. And it's the things. beauty is it's, it's still a Dash 10. We don't have yeah. to call it an ER. It's just a, a Dash 10 with a higher max takeoff weight capability. Sure. Yeah. Moving up okay. to the big boy. Yeah. Uh, the 777X, I think it's the star of yeah. this year's Paris Air Show. Every, yeah. Everyone wants to yeah. see it, yeah. right? Um, people are flocking to it. Uh, but something new that Boeing is bringing to the show is actually a cabin mock-up. Yes. And I think it's very interesting what you've done with it. Because if you think about Boeing's current product lineup, you have the 737 and the 787, both have this really strong brand identity with the Boeing Sky interior. Sure. For the 777X, things look a little bit different, yeah. right? You're adding new lighting, you're adding new pivot bins, mm -hmm. and it seems to be breaking from this strong brand identity. Can you tell me a little bit about the rationale for changing the 777X in a way that feels different from the current Boeing lineup? I guess I would call it more of an evolution. Uh, this 777X will be an extension to what we did with the kind of groundbreaking amenities of the 787. It's going to have the same cabin pressure altitude. It's going to have very similar window sizes. It's going to have the uh, next generation of dimmable windows on the aircraft. And it does so even, even in a wire, wider fuselage. So it gives airlines even more kind of flexibility in how they configure the aircraft. So I just think it's an exciting extension of our philosophy, not necessarily a departure. Sure. Yeah. Is it safe to say that that evolution may eventually make its way to the smaller lineup? Absolutely. 787, 737. I think our cabin philosophy will continue to look for ways to build those innovations into all of our airplanes. Mm -hmm. airplane. I think the other thing people want to know about the 777X yep. is when it's coming, right? right. Uh, it's been perpetually delayed. Yep. Entry into the service last we heard was 2025. Yep. Is that still the case? And can you kind of give us an update on yeah. where it stands so, in flight testing? Yeah, so um, flight test continues um, to the point where, you know, we're excited about that, you know, the next phase of flight test is really flying uh, uh, for the certification of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Nobody's more excited about bringing the aircraft actually into service than we are. You know, it's great to fly it at air shows and it's great to look at what it can do, but I can't wait to see it in our customer liveries flying passengers. Yeah. Um, and 20, mid 2025 is still uh, where we're targeting. We haven't had a change in, in our entry into service estimates mm -hmm. since, you know, this year or even, you know, the late part of last year. Do we have a launch customer? Uh, the launch, we have plenty of launch customers. <laughs> uh, I, I believe the launch operator will be Okay, that will be awesome. I know that you folks are very focused on certifying the 777-9. Mm. Last week it came out that Tim Clark of Emirates yeah. still hopes that Airbus might build an A380neo. Mm. Now, to me, that doesn't seem super likely to happen considering they've scrapped that production line and yeah. put a new aircraft in. And if that's the case, it obviously opens up a really big market opportunity for you folks yeah. since the Dash 9 is now the biggest plane on the market. Yeah. So when you think about A380 operators, do you think the Dash 9 has sufficient capacity to meet their needs or might a further stretch of the fuselage be in the cards. Yeah, I don't I don't see the stretch or a stretch being something that our customers want. I think the size of the aircraft, what it does, yes, it's not a 380 in terms of capacity, but it means you can be deployed, it can be deployed to far more routes in mm -hmm. terms of its capability. And if you need more capacity, there's frequency, right? You can fly a 787 and a 777X. You can fly two 777Xs if you need to. So I don't think that's a constraining factor. Airlines are more excited about the deployability of the product sure. and the efficiency, obviously, relative to what they'll replace. Mm -hmm. And the Dash 8 and the Dash 8 Freighter, yeah. I don't think we've gotten an update on those programs in yeah. some time. 
do you have a timeline for when those aircraft might be developed and which one might sure. be developed first? The first one is going to be the, the Dash 8 freighter. Okay. Uh, we launched the Dash 8 freighter, uh, I want to say it was sort of winter of 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, we're you know well over, I think we're in the 80s in terms of commitments and orders for the product. And that plane will enter service in 2027. Okay. So there, that's the first to market. Obviously, uh, same body length as the, the Dash 8 aircraft, the passenger aircraft, and that uh, will enter service later. I don't have an exact date for that at this point, but it's um, something that the market has told us becomes a huge value for a little bit of the 777-300ER replacement market and a lot of the potential ultra-long-range market that complements what the 777-9 will be able to do. Uh, on the, the note of the 300ER, mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that you guys didn't align one of the variants specifically with that, right? The Dash 8's yeah. a little bit smaller, and the Dash 9's yep. a little bit bigger. What was the rationale behind skewing the, sure. the capacity like that? Well, the 777-8, when it enters service, is just a fraction smaller than, than the 300ER. So if you need a like-for-like -like replacement, it definitely is in that space. Um, the 777-9 adds about 30 seats-ish, depending on how you configure today's aircraft mm -hmm. um, versus today's 300ER. And we see that just as natural market growth. You know, if you're flying a 777-300ER 85% full over the next 10 years, you're going to need a little extra capacity to continue to facilitate that uh, uh, incremental market growth. And so sure. we saw that in addition to replacing big airplanes like the 747 and the A380, that's really kind of the reason why we had that uh, increase in capacity, just to provide that extra, extra revenue. And Darren, to wrap things up, yep. you've been at Boeing a long time. Yep. When you think about the future yeah. of this company, what gets you most excited? What makes you most uh, well, fulfilled coming to work every day? Okay, so two things. One, um, the resilience of the market is something that is just exciting to watch. I mean, there's no boring days in aviation because there's always something changing, whether it's airline networks, whether it's startups, whether it's um, competition that exists in the space. And so that's exciting because it's, it's just refreshing to watch how airlines are able to use aircraft to connect the world. And sure. it's great to be a part of that industry. On, on the other side, I think, you know, as we look at our market, the, the products that we have developed, the products that we're bringing to market over the next few years, we think are perfectly positioned for the demand in the market. And so I think we got the right products for a, a growing demand that we see well into the 2040s. Sure. And um, it's going to be exciting to see these new products take flight, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's um, the, the Dash 10 with more capability or whether it's the 7779. Uh, entering service like we all can't wait to see. Yeah, yeah. I know I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. All right, Darren, thanks so much for your Thank time. Thank you so much. It was Appreciate great to see it. you. So that's about it. That's what you can expect from Boeing in the near future. If you enjoyed this conversation, well, you're in luck. I also sat down with Airbus's head of marketing for a similar discussion, which I'll be publishing in the next few days. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Thanks again to Darren for being so generous with his time and expertise, and until I see you again, don't forget to look up.